Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, and on the podcast, we talk about all things to increase muscle performance, metabolic health, and improve your body composition, all within a flexible framework that you can apply and actually do. Today's guest on the podcast is my good buddy, Aram. You may have recognized him from his website, Four Weeks to the Beach, and he was also the organizer of the great Real Coaches Summit in Vegas this past year, and it was awesome. I was honored to present there, got to hang out with a lot of cool people. I heard a rumor that he is planning on doing it next year, so we'll put a link where you can check out the information there. And this topic, I guess, discussion ranges everything from how to design studies for the average Joe or Jane, what is useful nutrition advice, you talk about metabolic flexibility, some health parameters, our rants about coaching in general, just a wide ranging conversation of me asking him questions and him asking me a lot of questions, which is great. And the podcast today is brought to you by the Flex Diet Certification. It's coming up very soon. It opens June 5th, 2023, and it'll be open until June 12th at midnight, 2023. If you're listening outside of that period or this is afterwards, you can still go to flexdiet.com and you can get onto the waitlist. If you're listening now before it opens, I would highly recommend you join the waitlist. I'll have some exclusive bonus items there for you. And if you happen to listen while it's open, you can go to the same site and it'll bring you directly into the page to learn more information. So go to flexdiet.com and this will be your one-stop certification for everything in nutrition and recovery. Everything from protein to fats, carbohydrates, neat, sleep, and much more. The cool part is it's all set up in a complete system so that you'll understand the big picture and the context of the framework, which is based on flexible dieting and metabolic flexibility. If you don't understand either one of those, that's fine. We'll explain them to you. And then each one of the eight interventions has a one-hour technical video. So everything you wanted to know about protein on more of the technical side. And then each one has five action items so that you'll know within the system, we show you how to apply each one to each person. So you don't necessarily have to count macros in order to do it. It's a little bit more on the habit-based side of the house. And the nice part is you'll have literally the complete system that I've put together over the last, oh man, 15 plus years now of researching metabolic flexibility. It was a topic of my PhD dissertation in exercise physiology. And I've also used this through various programs and with clients for that, literally that entire time. So you can get all that condensed knowledge down into less than a 30-hour certification. And then we also have great expert interviews, everybody from Dr. Stu Phillips on protein, Dr. Jose Antonio, Dr. Eric Helms on flexible dieting, Dr. Hunter Waldman talking about metabolic flexibility, Dr. Stephen Guiané about the neuroregulation of nutrition and appetite, Dr. Dan Party about sleep, and many others. So there's lots of experts there you can learn even more from if you want to take a deeper dive. So go to flexdiet.com for all of the information there and enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with my good buddy, Aram. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Huge thanks to Aram for listening and being here on the podcast and all the work that he's been doing, especially with the Real Coaches Summit. You can... Go to the link below we'll have here to get on the wait list to be notified of more information. So far, depending upon the date, we are planning to be there next year. It looks as of this recording, it'll be in March, but he may have announced some information there. So enter the email there and you'll be updated with all the information. I look forward to seeing you there. Also check out his website, Four Weeks to the Beach. We'll have that link down below here. And if you want to learn more about nutrition and recovery, but you want it in a complete system, not just piecemeal, then you're never really sure what is actually the next thing to do or why the heck you're doing it, 
go to the flexdiet.com. It's actually flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com. The Flex Diet certification opens again June 5th, 2023. It'll only be open for seven days until June 12th. So go to the site, you'll be able to sign up on the wait list. You'll get all the information as soon as it re is released. Now, this is mainly for coaches. About 60% of the people that have gone through the certification are coaches or trainers in some fashion. And 40% are actually just really interested fitness enthusiasts who want to learn more about nutrition and apply the system to themselves. So go to flexdiet.com. Hey, welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. And I'm here with my buddy, Aram, who did the presentations and all the conference fun stuff we did at the Real Coaches Seminar in Vegas a couple of weeks ago. How's it going, man? We're here, man. We're recovered. I kept sending you my sleep day. I was like sleeping forever for like two weeks after that. <laughs> I still don't, I still don't know how it's possible. You hibernate like a bear. Oh, totally. hundred percent. That's what happens when you live in the Northern part of the most miserable part of America. Yeah. That's why I left them in South Padre right now, Texas. So <laughs> yeah. Maybe for the seasons. I talked to my sister today when we're recording. She's like, yeah, it's not a foot last night again. Oh, like, what in April? It's so crazy. I'm like, oh, I'm not there. Utah, have you seen Utah? Utah is getting destroyed. It's like they're 30 to 20 to 30 inches a day some days. And it's covering houses. It's covering restaurants. Like people can't get anywhere. I'm sorry. Like I'm from Russia, man. I don't ever, I don't want to see a drop of snow in front of me ever again. It, it just makes life so much more inconvenient. You add yeah, 45 minutes. I agree with that. It's like, I got to get up in the morning. Cool. Now I got to wake up at four to shovel off my car and get it started. The dogs don't want to go and pee outside. Like it's just, everything sucks. And then the snow, the snow enthusiasts are like, but it's so magical and it's so beautiful. I'm like, great. When you don't have to do anything, but when you're a nine-year-old kid who got class canceled because of snow, it's amazing. When yeah. you're a 39 year old adult who has to go to work and get places, it sucks ass. Yeah. I don't miss those days in Minnesota of driving around in snow. I and mean, when I grew up, like. I did not even have a front wheel drive car until <laughs> seven, no, eight years ago now. I didn't have a four wheel drive vehicle until the one we have now, which I bought, we got this two, three years ago. I remember like driving back home, I was working at a co-working place and it snowed maybe six inches. I wasn't paying attention. And I'm like, oh, that's probably going to suck, but I'll make it. And I forgot we had a four wheel drive SUV and I get out there and I'm just like, oh, I'm like, Oh, I see why people have four wheel drive in the winter. This is amazing. You're like me, man. You have these like technological revelations that make your life slightly more comfortable. Yeah. But I think when you, this is such a great segue into talking what we're going to talk about, but human beings need to relearn how to be uncomfortable to some extent. Oh, hundred percent. Like we've been so conditioned to be pampered, to have everything catered to us, to have zero discomfort, zero expectation of pain. And I never grew up like that. Like I had, I was an immigrant from Russia. I came here with literally nothing. Like I watched my parents work three jobs a piece. I cooked my own lunch when I got home from school. I did my own homework. I cleaned the house. There was no, there was no allowance. There was no like what's on the dinner <laughs> table. It was like, you figure this shit out yourself. We'll be home at nine o'clock tonight. And now it's like, it's something, something as simple as just making your own food is now a problem. Like yeah. the amount of adults that I have to teach how to brown beef in a pan. And I'm like, why am I teaching you this when you're almost 50 years old? Where, what have you been doing for the last 30 years? Yeah, I, for years of coaching, I like refused to believe that. And then it struck me like maybe five, six years ago, like pretty late that, oh, you don't even know how to grill a chicken breast. Like you have no clue. So you go through the thing, you keep making it simpler, simpler. Okay. And I'm like, okay, so why didn't you make your pro? I don't really know what to do. What do you mean you don't know what to do? Like you heat it up. How long do I heat it? Do I bake it? Do I... Well, what do you have access to? I only have an oven. Okay. Put in a glass pan, throw some tinfoil over it, put it in the oven and make sure it's not raw. Don't kill yourself. And they're like, but I've never done this before. I'm like, what? It's like just mind blowing at times. <laughs> but you know what? And that's why I think it's a godsend that our career exists. Oh, yeah. You're not coaching people anymore as much, or are you coaching people at all anymore? No. I limited 
to 12 people. So I have okay. 12 online people. Just got it. Yeah, just due to other projects and stuff. But I always say that I'm going to phase that out. And I haven't even opened it to the public for like two and a half years, to be honest. Just people graduate, get a few referrals. But I, yeah, I from a time perspective, it's not the best use of my time. I also don't want to be one of these dickheads that's never coached anyone and talk about it either. So I always feel like I have to keep some people around just to run experiments and shit on. I respect that though, man, because this is, and this, maybe you and I can have a little bit of a, a sidebar conversation on this because there's a problem that I have with academia. I respect the shit out of people that have PhDs that are doing the research that are in the trenches of that kind of stuff. But like this idea that there's no such thing as an inflammatory food because no PubMed article has ever said it was, or there's no such thing as reverse dieting. It doesn't work because there's no literature on it. Like, I'm so tired of this narrative that unless there's literature on it, it's not real. Like anecdotal evidence carries power, in my opinion. Like work with 500 people and tell me that an abundance of processed foods doesn't fuck people up. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And tell me, of course, maybe it's not pinpointed down to seed oils or omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, but there's probably a pretty good likelihood that when somebody cleans up their eating and then they go out to eat at a restaurant and that food is cooked in a vegetable oil versus an olive oil, and they're getting some type of a reaction from it. Okay, maybe we could start to extrapolate some shit. But yeah. it's just this blatant narrative that just exists. If you're either like on the evidence-based side or you're on this like influencer side and there's just no middle ground anymore, just like everything else in our country. Yeah, that's my pet peeve. So I get, let's say, hate mail from clinicians, practitioners, and researchers. Imagine that. Because this happened to me years ago. I won't say his name, but he's a pretty <laughs> popular coach. He's, you're just a blogger. You don't work with anyone. I've worked with people for 20 more years than you have. And I'm like, yeah, you have. And guess what? In 10 years from now, you'll still have worked with more people for 20 more years yeah. than I will. Like, I don't know what you want me to do about that. And you've got the whole academic side that's, oh, you only published 12 research studies and that's not enough. I've got hundreds. And I'm like, but the interesting stuff is the interface, right? Yeah. Because research doesn't have all the answers. And then there's a lot of anecdotal stuff that sometimes does turn out 100% to be true and is five, 10 years ahead of the research. And there's sometimes that it was just stupid and we shouldn't have done it anyway, but it seemed like it worked. And the answer is not perfect. If you, I feel like, it, especially now, like if you live in any point in the applied realm, like I'll never have, like for some of the shit I do, I'll never have enough PubMed re research to appease the research people, but it's some, and, and it's a direction. And I'll probably never have enough direct experience for the, the hardcore coaches who live in a gym for 40, 60, 70 hours a week, which is great. I don't have any disrespect to either side, but it's, I don't know. I think both sides get over glamorized and now it's almost my pet peeve with some academics is yeah, your interpretation of the research is correct. But I can tell by your recommendations, you've never coached a single person because what you just recommended for repeated Tabatas for 12 rounds, you do, elite athletes didn't complete the damn Tabata study. 170% of two max, they didn't even complete it. So I can, in theory, yes, that's great. That's awesome. But I can tell you never applied this with a normal human because you would learn within two people, that's a really dumb idea. And that's the other part is how do we create studies that are going to capture Mr. and Mrs. Jones, who's 45 years old. Yeah. Who's got a full-time job and three kids and a high percentage of body fat and a low percentage of muscle mass and a low training acumen and a low cooking acumen and poor mental health. Like that person is not subjecting themselves to research. No, it's, it's, it's the same argument with elite athletes. If I went to Cal Dietz when I was at the University of Minnesota, I'm like, Hey man, you know what? Give me your high level athletes. I want them to do this program for eight weeks. And then this other controlled program for eight weeks at the same time, he'd be like, fuck you. There's no way I'm letting you do that. His job is he gets paid a lot of money to get the highest level of performance he can from his athletes. He's not paid to get, let me finish and do a research study with him. But everyone's like, oh, you need more elite athletes. They're not you know, even like general population. A lot of times it's not representative in the people that were studied. No, of course it isn't, but it probably is 
never going to be represented to the level that we would like to see it. It's just not going to happen, unfortunately. We have to be able to, as people in this field, we have to be able to water this information down because the elite athletes don't need our fucking help. Not usually. Like, they they're the easiest like, to coach. Correct. Like you give me, you give me somebody who's got 16 weeks out of pro. That's why I don't coach bodybuilders because it would be boring to me. <laughs> like you, you give me a woman with an eating disorder and a lifetime of body dysmorphia who's never set foot into a gym, who's never picked up a dumbbell. That's coaching. That's a challenge. Yeah. That's somebody that you have to fight tooth and nail to convince them that they're not going to get bulky, that they should be eating some carbs, that they need to be able to strength train, that they need to go to bed at nine o'clock at night. That's not an easy case, but that's the people who need our help. We don't need to be, we don't need to be focusing on the gym rats who are already sourcing this information on their own. If they fucked themselves up because they read the wrong blog, so be it. That's not <laughs> my responsibility. I don't, I don't feel personally re irresponsible to, or that I delivered the wrong information to them. What I am responsible for is making sure that the lay person who is the statistic of obesity that we're trying to fight is the person who's getting this information because that stuff is still not common knowledge by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, no, I agree. The only counter argument I would make is that there, there is some stuff you can learn by working with elite athletes that does transfer down to general population, right? So like when I did engineering, why does Ford and all these high-end motor companies race F1 cars and do all this high-end stuff? Yeah, it's brand promotion. It's all that kind of stuff. But they also realized that they had to solve hard problems there to come up with new technology that within five, 10, 15 years would just be in your average grocery getter. But I think we do a hard time or bad time translating that also. And the industry itself, it's looked upon as, oh, I could rattle off like a bunch of NFL and NHL athletes I've worked with. Great. People are like, oh, wow, you must really know what's going on. I'm like, eh. If you've seen some of the coaches at some of these organizations, granted, it's <clears throat> much better now than it was 15 years ago. And like teaching an elite athlete to squat or... Becky, who's never squatted in her life, what's harder to do? Like, Becky is way harder to teach how to do a squat. The elite athlete, are like, ah, oh, bring your butt back further. Boom, they figured it out. Yeah, done. Becky's, yeah. like, oh, where's the chair? But, and that's why I think it's so important for us to be able to disseminate this stuff and put it together in an organized, organized digestible manner that makes sense. And, that, and now we're being, and now it's just information from a fire hose on Instagram. It's, oh, yeah. Fasting. Keto, this is wrong. That's right. Carnivore, vegan. Nobody knows what the hell is going on. A quick story. Like I have a client who's started with me. She's early 30 school teacher. Her religion has nothing to do with it. But as somebody who's from the Jewish community, I don't know a ton of Jewish moms who want their daughters deadlifting 75 pound dumbbells because... <laughs> It's immediately like this, oh, you're going to get, your back's going to get blown out. That's, you know what I mean? It's no different than like when I showed my parents powerlifting videos when I was in my early 20s. They're like, why are you lifting so heavy? You're going to get hurt. Because that's this old school narrative that still exists. First of all, women shouldn't be lifting weights. And why, if you are, they should be very light. You should be doing a million reps with them or else you're going to break. So she's in her, she's in her family house in Florida celebrating Passover. And she's excited about her progress. And she's showing her videos off to her family. And she's talking about the amount of protein she's eating and how she's feeling so good. And they're just immediately start ripping her apart. Oh yeah. And it's an alienating feeling. And I feel bad because like, I've been lucky enough to surround myself with like-minded individuals, connect with people that I can communicate with. I don't talk about this shit with my family. They don't <laughs> fucking know. Like my father's 75 years old. He starts every day off with a shot of vodka with some pepper in it, a quarter stick of butter melted into some milk. And that's what he starts his day off with. <laughs> Now, granted, he'll probably outlive me somehow. I don't know how, <laughs> but his blood work is perfect. His HDLDL is great. His liver and kidney functions are probably better than mine. His blood pressure is decent. Like he's not in poor health, but it's just this phenomenon you can't even explain. And then you got guys like me who are like sitting there testing blood glucose and like getting HRV and like tracking their <laughs> macros. And then they die of 55 of a fucking coronary disease. And there's just no way to explain it. Yeah, there's always random effects that are going to happen or you get taken out by a school bus or whatever bad shit's going to happen to you. But that's what I'm hoping for. Just yeah. back and put one in the back of the head when I'm not looking. Yeah. My wife and I said, hopefully die in a skydiving accident when we're a hundred. Oh, that'd be, that'd be fun. Good. Yeah. That'd be Splat. Good. Don't even pull the chute. <laughs> Just have you ever skydiving? Have you ever went skydiving before? 
Yes. Yeah. The most terrifying thing I've ever done in my entire life. Cause really? I had sure fly to heights. Had sure fly uh, to heights. Oh, okay. See, I felt like I didn't feel like I was falling. The free fall from like that 60 seconds coming out of the plane, you feel like you're falling. But then when you're like parachuting around, you just feel like you're floating. Yeah, I felt better when I did it as a tandem because I knew oh. I wasn't driving the damn thing. The first time I did it as a static line, which I think oh. was only legal in the UP of Michigan. And this plane was just a heap of trash that I would have never gotten in without a chute. I think they were out there duct taping the wing on. I literally <laughs> heard the pilot say, Oh, we only filled the gas tank on the right side because I think the one on the left is like just leaking gas all over the runway. We'll be hey. fine. Oh my God. Uh, and you had to hang from a pull up bar off of the wing of the plane to be stable because you're only at 3,000 feet. So you have to get all the way out to the pull up bar off the edge of the wing of the plane and hang oh. there. <laughs> and I asked the instructor guy, I said, um, What happens if I get out there and I can't like, and he's, I crawl out there and pull your fingers off one by one until you drop. Because once you get on the bar, you can't get your ass back in the plane. So you're going down. I was like, oh, okay. That's how we should start coaching people. Sink or swim, yeah. baby, let's go. Time to fly. Out of the nest you go. That's Good luck. It. Learn yeah. to fly on the way down. <laughs> no, I think the, the work that you're doing with the metabolic flexibility thing, I think is so important because I think this is such a misunderstood topic. Like I just had this conversation. I have a, one of my clients is a ER doctor, really smart guy. Cause he's actually very curious about outs about the disciplines outside of his scope. Nice. So like, he reads a lot of literature. He's, he's reading up on different dieting protocols and how they apply to certain populations. So he's very much immersed in the wellness, health and fitness space on top of also being a great ER doctor. But the stuff is an ER doctor. It's not, they're dealing with shit that's very acute, immediate. We need to get this thing wrapped up, figured out right now. He's just, he's not dealing with long-term chronic right. illness. He's not dealing with body transformation stuff. So it's not a world that he's real well versed in, but he started reading, I forgot which, I forgot who the author was, but the guy who talks about being like fat adapted versus being carb adapted. Oh, okay. I don't, you probably know more than I do. Oh, well, well, there's a bunch of them doing that now, but. Peter something. Not Peter Atia, but somebody else, whatever it is. But well, he, was basically, he was basically saying he's, he started eating less carbs because he wanted to be fat adapted. I said, yeah, if you take the word that they say, that's what your understanding of it is, then sure. It's a very one-to-one -one ratio. I eat less carbs. My body burns more fat, but it's also because you're just eating less carbs. So now your body doesn't need to burn the carbs. So your body will burn whatever the prevalent fuel source is that's coming in. If you're eating more fat than carbs, you're going to burn more fat. If you're burning yeah. more, especially if you're more. healthy. Yeah. So it's not that your body's taking fat out of tissue and preferentiating it to burn as fuel. That still requires you to be in an energy deficit. Yeah, and that's the confusing thing. And I get interesting emails on this too. Of they're like, oh, but you're talking about your body. You're trying to train it to be better able to use fat. And I'm like, yes. And they're like, oh. But you didn't say from dietary fat or body fat, and you didn't talk about body composition. I said, no, I was just trying to explain the basics of metabolic flexibility. Anytime you use fat as a fuel or burn fat, people automatically assume that, oh, my body cop must be getting better. And then all the evidence-based people lose their mind because you didn't clarify that, oh, you could be burning fat that you took in from food. I'm like, yeah, you could. Depends on if you measured it fasted or if you measure it after a meal, but it, yeah. And even a lot of the people in the industry who have books and stuff like that are, oh, you're a car burner or you should be a fat burner. It's like, they make you pick one or the other. They yeah, make it yeah. sound like being a car burner is like this horrible thing. You want to be using fat. It's yeah. But if you ever try to do a ketogenic diet and do any like speed and power stuff, it sucks. It's a horrible. And if you want to live your life like that, cool, man, that's great. I don't care. There's a cost associated to that too. And there's no toggle switch. It's not like you it's not like you can like flick this thing on the side of your head and be like, okay, today I'm going to be burning mostly carbs and then tomorrow yeah. I'm going to burn mostly <laughs> fat. It's going to be like, no, and like this idea that the metabolism is broken or it's like this plate glass window that we can just throw a brick through and it just shatters as we get older. It's also bullshit. Like it adapts and reacts to the actions that you take throughout your lifetime. If you feed it a yep. certain way, it does a certain thing. If you don't feed it a certain way, it doesn't do a certain, like that's all it is. And I think human beings love finding the silver bullet point in everything. It's all, this is the reason why I'm not 
improving my body composition. This is, this must be the thing. It's I'm 50. My metabolism is just completely shut down. I just can't <laughs> eat any food anymore whatsoever. What's the point? So it's, I will, and what I always try to do is I try to explain to people, like, there's always hope. You're not broken. You're not beyond repair. You still can change your habits. Like this idea of an old dog, new tricks. Like it doesn't, yes, you can have, if you want to change. It's going to be fucking uncomfortable. I'm sorry. Oh, you've, yeah. li you've lived a certain way and you believe certain things that you've had in your head for 40 years. It's going to be very difficult to undo those belief systems and to install new habits. But I promise you, there's plenty of 75 year old bodybuilders who get on stage for the first time ever because they decided to do it at 70. There's plenty of people that are power athletes who decided to start deadlifting at 65 when most of their orthopedic surgeons told them they should never deadlift because it's bad for their back. <laughs> So the amount of misinformation that exists, I think, I think is the reason why so many lay people are so lost when it comes to this stuff. And then when you even dive further into the coaching world and the professionals that are, are talking about this information, they read the abstracts of studies and they don't ever deep dive into any of the actual literature. So they don't really understand how to interpret it properly. So for me, like, I know I don't want to waste my time with that. Like I'm just, <laughs> it's, you read research, it's fucking dry. Yeah. It's boring. It takes oh, forever. It bores me. I like it. I like reading the research because I like getting the information. And I've been to conferences, experimental biology, where they're droning on about some genetic changes in the freaking fruit fly or whatever, and it's dark and I'm almost asleep. And I like this shit. <laughs> but you could not make stuff more dry and unappealing to the masses. But I get it. That's just kind of the way it's evolved. But there are people that are out there that are professionally, have businesses set up to read, interpret, and then regurgitate that research in a more lay way. So why not Eric Trexler and those guys? Yeah, I love Matt. I love there's, those guys. There's people out there that are doing this work, like Brett Contreras, Lane Norton. These guys are doing this type of research and then they're spitting it out. I'll get it secondhand. I don't mind admitting that I don't want to read this stuff. I don't mind. Yeah. It doesn't make me any less of a professional. I just don't, like you said, my time is better spent working with my people. So totally. and half, half the time, they don't need to be explained this level of nuance. Oh, God, no. Like, Jesus, you're just going to make their head spin off their shoulders. If you start bringing up the idea that you can be fat versus carb adapted to Mrs. Jones, and if you eat less carbs, that your body will burn more fat, that woman will never put a carb inside of her body. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and that, and think about how dangerous that can actually be, or if it's the other way. And that's the problem is like, there's, we take these super biologically complex processes and we try to dumb them down and narrow them to this little point that your normal four-year-old can understand it. And then it gets completely misunderstood and misused as a protocol. I don't think keto yeah. and fasting and all these things are bad things. I just think they need to be deployed appropriately. It's the context, right? Nobody wants yeah. to talk about context. Like I'm not a big fan of keto for general population, but I've coached clients and we've used the keto approach and they liked it. It's been good. If you tell me your favorite foods are like you put butter on everything and you could eat bacon all day, keto might be pretty good for you. If your favorite food is pasta, English muffins, and donuts, keto is probably going to suck really bad for you. Like maybe you shouldn't <laughs> start there. But again, I have a whole program on a ketogenic diet and ketones for concussion and potentially TBI through the Kerrigan Institute. Again, that's a pathology though. And in that case, I could make, oh God, I did a nine hour thing on it. I think there's some pretty good data in that area. But again, people see that and they're like, hey, so I'm healthy. This is the thing for me. No, this is you know, whacked in the head and your glucose metabolism doesn't work worth a shit. It is not the same context that you're dealing with, but nobody wants to hear context. They just want to hear, keto is great. That's what I do. Oh, okay. It's also this desire to belong to a camp. Oh, for have, sure. And I think, Tribal the, thing. I think the one thing that diets did well was put a framework into somebody's life that they didn't have before. Most people, if you walk down the street in any, I don't care if you're in San Diego, Miami, wherever you want to go and ask somebody like just a random person off the street, how many grams of protein do you eat in a day? Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't fucking know. No. One of the, one of the questions I ask in all my intake forms is like, I said, can you name me five carb, five fat and five protein sources? Ooh, that's a good one. And that's just, that's literally like, like my first five questions out of the gate when I'm talking to somebody, this is after they've already signed up. Like they've been reading my content on Instagram. Like they know all about me. First five, first, what are five fat, carb, and protein sources? And the amount of people that get through two and then can't name any more, or the people that don't understand that carbs and fruits or uh, fruits and vegetables are carbs, or the amount of people that are telling me that viable sources of protein are peanut butter, 
cheese. It's, cheese, yeah, cheese, cheese and peanut butter. There's two answers I constantly get. I'm like, sure, but like, how many grams of fat are you ingesting for every gram of protein? Mm-hmm. Probably not a very efficient. Like, even an egg, if you think about it, like an egg is not a great source of protein. If you're thinking about it just from a numbers perspective, like sure, an egg, yeah, yeah. egg whites out of a carton, sure, pure protein, yeah. but an egg in itself is higher in fat than it is in protein. So is it a better fat source than it is a protein source? I would argue that it's probably a better fat source. If you scramble two eggs together with 200 grams of egg whites, now you have an abundance of protein. Now we can call it a protein source. Sure. But that's the stuff that like, like just putting, do you eat about the same 20 foods on a weekly basis? Or are you just all over the map? Do you eat it about the same time? So what a diet has done is it's taken somebody with no structure whatsoever and applied some framework to them. And then just by default, they start losing weight because they're controlling calories more. So it's not oh, like yeah. this hedonistic fucking free for all that we all love. And listen, we're all, Lord knows I, I put three puffs of a joint in my mouth and all my nutrition coaching goes off the window. Yeah. <laughs> just if you put a bag of Stacy's pita chips in me, that's a carb source. Mm-hmm. It's coming. That's just getting destroyed. Yeah. There's no yeah. self-regulation. There's no stopping. It's just and my finger needs to hit the bottom of the bag. Yeah. That's why I don't keep like Reese's peanut butter cups around. I had a guy. Shout out to Trevor, Coach Catalyst. I did some stuff with him and he asked, what's your favorite candy? And so he sent me a bunch of Reese's peanut butter cups and I think they lasted two days. It was like... Trevor, that bastard. He did it on purpose. I know, know, probably. Yeah, he's let's fatten Mike T up a little bit. for. Yeah, but uh, the other experiment we used to do with clients was not even related to calories was, okay, we know you're probably eating the same 12 to 20 foods, whether you lie to me or not or whatever. So your whole thing now is uh, you're going to go to the grocery store. You're going to walk around the outside of the grocery store. And I want you to pick something that you have not eaten ideally ever, but I'll even settle for in the last year. I don't even care what it is. And they're like, oh my God, like, how do I decide? I don't know. Just look at shit and go, does this sound good? You're just doing anything to try to get them out of the habit of like getting the same things. And I've had some clients that were so resistant to that. I'm like, okay, so you like Greek yogurt. I want you to buy... You can even have the same macros in your yogurt, but I want you to buy a different brand this time. Like, why? This makes no sense. I'm like, it's the same macros, but you realize I'm trying to get you to do something a little bit different. Ideally, I would have you pick a different food, but that's not going to work for you because you gave me a shit fit already about it. So I'm trying to get you to get a different brand now to to, just try to get some more expansion into your life for crying out loud. (laughs) Now, are you somebody who believes in the idea of, and obviously this is a rabbit hole that can be so deep, it's ridiculous, but the idea of having wide array of foods from a digestive capability standpoint? I would say overall, yes. The caveat being, do you need to live there all the time? Probably not. Yeah. What I look at it is, in my biased opinion, you want the highest capacity to digest food and make food sources out of it and not have any digestion issues. So for example, like some of the special forces people I've worked with, we had this one guy was so funny. He he comes in, he's super regimented. He was going through selection, so he hadn't been through yet. Oh, he's just a green beret? He was doing for Rangers. Oh, wow. Uh, So he was going to go into the selection process. And so I was working with him for six months before. And I get his nutrition list and all of his supplements and organic this and kale that. And he's got everything detailed to the ninth. And I'm like, how do you feel? He's, oh, pretty good. And I'm like, okay. Now you realize when you go through selection and if you make it through selection and let's say you're doing the job later, there's no whole foods on the corner that you're going to get all this shit at. And he's like, oh. So we actually went through a whole process to basically dirty his diet up to get him to survive on Twinkies and Pop-Tarts and God knows whatever else he could find. Because the mistake I made with those guys five years earlier is I didn't do that and none of them made it. They just got destroyed oh. by like the change in food, the stress, everything else. And it's so funny that you'll talk to people who've been doing it for a while, like a new guy will make it through selection somehow and he'll show up with all this like super detailed stuff and they're like, hey, yeah, you've got to learn. He's not going to make it so well. Another buddy of mine went, got deployed in, he didn't say where, somewhere in Southeast Asia years ago. And I said, how did the mission go? He's, I was the only one who was actually functional. Thank God it was a training mission. I said, what happened? He's the other four guys, since we're in the middle of nowhere, we off with some of the street carts and other food that's potentially a little suspect. Oh. He's like, they were in the shitter for three days. He's like, I'm used to this shit. I had no problems. I mean, anything I could find, it was great. 
It's yeah. almost like re-inoculating your stomach again. It's not, and it sucks because my, like I have a really sensitive stomach. There's definitely a stuff that I just stay away from. And it sucks not having that flexibility. But I think when we're talking about people in lay terms, just because you're married to something and that's the modality or the structure that you think you have to have, even just something as simple as like people naming their meals. Oh, right? like, like we have this idea that it has to be breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And there's certain kinds of breakfast foods that are specific yeah. for breakfast and lunch has its own type of cuisine and dinner is its own. It's like dogs don't do that. They just no. eat meal one, two, and three, and they're happy as clams and they're in pretty good fucking shape. So I try to tell people like it's meal one through whatever the last one is. And it could be fish and broccoli for breakfast and it can be eggs and toast for dinner. It doesn't fucking matter. Like just is calorically and digestively, as long as you're feeling where you need to feel and things are going well, let's not pigeonholes our, ourselves into thinking that you have to eat certain types of foods at certain times. I'm happy that you at least are already thinking about the time of eating, but even that for most people, like meal timing for your average individual doesn't really fucking matter. No, even at eye level meal timing doesn't make a huge difference for most people, but I agree like you're any little things you can do like that to try to get them out of their normal conventions, I just find is, is so much better, right? Because my bias, similar to yours, is I'm not thinking about restriction unless I absolutely have to. I'm thinking about expansion. And even if restriction is the goal, can I expand something else so that you purposely restrict the other thing, right? So I may go super high on protein to try to get you to stop putting cheese doodles in your face all day. Right. Cause if I tell you stop eating cheese doodles, and I made this mistake early on with the Oreo cookies, guy comes in and look at his nutrition thing. It was like one of my first clients eons ago. And he's eating like a sleeve of Oreos a day. <laughs> is this nutrition coaching stuff so hard? This is so simple. Bro, stop eating Oreos. It's, oh, yeah. You know, man, I eat way too many Oreos. I'm like, okay, cool. Comes back two weeks later, still eating a sleeve of Oreos a day. I said, bro, we talked about the Oreos, right? Said, I know I feel bad. No. This goes on because I'm not very bright for six weeks. And finally, I just got so disgusted. I'm just like, okay, whatever. I don't care. Eat as many damn Oreos as you want. Doesn't matter to me. But I want you to eat protein first, and then you can eat Oreos. He's like, oh. okay, I can do that. So 40 grams of protein, eat as many Oreos as you want after. He comes back. He's only eating like half a sleeve of Oreos a day. And then I realized, I'm like, oh, shit, I'm an idiot. Because like, how is the brain wired? Your brain is wired visually. Right? So if I ask you, like, how tall are the windows in your living room? What would you say? How tall are the windows? I don't have any windows in my living room. Oh, okay. How tall is your doorway to your bedroom? Six feet. And how did you figure that out? I walked through it. Yeah. You imagine yourself standing there. You're about six feet tall relative to the doorway, right? Mm -hmm. So we store everything visually. So when I'm telling this poor guy, like, stop eating Oreos, like, all he's thinking of is Oreos. Don't think of a pink elephant. Shit, I thought of a pink elephant, right? So I'm, and then you have the psychological thing on top of it where he feels bad that he's still doing the thing that I told him not to do, but I'm subconsciously reminding him about Oreos all the damn time. So once I increased his protein, didn't mention Oreos and just tracked it, oh, he all of a sudden ate less of them. So I was like, oh. So because if it was as simple as like, just here's your list of naughty versus nice foods, then Nobody would need coaching. They'd buy a diet book and they would never hear from them again, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> well, we have to remember that there's still this really large portion of this that's human psychology that is so very oh, yeah. and so individual and the amount of trauma and the amount of misconception and the amount of social learning and conditioning and everything. The rabbit hole on that is so far and vast that I... Meal plans to me, the fact that they're still being prescribed on like an hourly basis to people who... I was... Like, I just started with a coach two weeks ago. Oh, cool. Um, I just started with uh, Jace Lopez, who was oh, cool. Speaker's awesome. Guest. Cool, dude. So I want to do a photo shoot for my 40th birthday, which there is not until next year, February. So I figure, let me just get my shit together for a year. I haven't really had anybody look at my stuff ever. And I like him. I think he's a good dude. I think, yeah. I think he's, a, he's, he's definitely a bodybuilding coach. So it's a little bit oh, yeah. hard. <laughs> but, so he gives me a meal plan. And I basically told him, like, okay, what type of compliance are you expecting here? And he's 100%. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, Jace, I love you, man, but yeah. you're getting, you're getting 90, 95. Yeah. Oh, like, that's, I'm going to do 90%. I do that shit all. 
That's great. Well, I've been tracking my food for 10 years. Now, granted, am I perfect? When I made salads at night, was I tracking vegetables? No. Uh, but the way that I, the way that I think about it is like, if anybody's, if you're getting to, if, sure, if you're getting down to 3% body fat, sure, track every piece of yeah. food that goes into your face. But if you're like, if you're just trying to feel and look a little bit better, there, there is not one person on this planet that's had a, a body fat issue because they overrate vegetables or fruit. No. I can't imagine that. Okay, fine. Maybe if somebody like my mother who loves grapes can probably, <laughs> can probably overconsume grapes at night. But even then, there's just this like natural... It's almost if you ate something sweet that was processed, you have no filter and no off switch for it. But then like naturally, like how many oranges can you eat with the same appetite after each one? It's almost like your appetite for it decreases with, with every morsel of food when it's real. Especially Versus you have to like, work for it and feel it and fiber, all that stuff. And like, I think with the highly palatable processed foods, they're intended for you to overconsume. Like they're goal, right? literally g designed for you to just eat as much of it as humanly possible and never stop. So I don't know if, and then this is probably something you or you could speak to more than I can, but is it because of the chemical composition of it? Is it because of the way our brain is wired? Is it because of the way of our society and hunger hormones are structured? Like, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Uh, the best book on that is uh, Stefan Guiné, The Hungry oh, yeah. Brain. Yeah. yeah. Love that dude. Like his book, so awesome in that area. But my understanding is we're basically cavemen with cell phones, right? Like we're still wired for like food to be like unavailable and scarce and hard to get to. Like our physiology hasn't changed that much. No. And I'm guilty of this too. In the past, I'd be like, oh God, why did that client go through the drive through at Burger King? What are they doing? Don't they know that's not very good? And then I realized I'm like, to their physiology, that's actually efficiency. That even now, like I could take my phone and punch two things on it and food shows up at my door. That's efficiency. Like you are literally wired to be as efficient as possible. Now, unfortunately, in our environment, that goes against it because in the past, you had to hunt wild game, which maybe took one, two, three days, run around pounding the ground for a couple of tubers. Woo like food wasn't easy to get. Yeah. And now it is, but our wiring hasn't changed. Like we're still, we're still driven to be like, okay, this is an efficiency thing. If I can get more calories cheaper with less effort, Ooh, I lived longer a couple hundred years ago. Now, not so much because the effort put in to do that is like minimal. And like you're talking about at the beginning to be uncomfortable and unbalanced. Like you have to go against kind of what society is going because all these companies, they just want to make more money. And if they figure out a way to get you to eat more cheese doodles by putting more salt and more fat and whatever else in it. And they actually have, if you look at the food science and stuff, it's crazy. Like they have this thing that'll measure like the factor of crunch and that gets into a lot of clients store tension in their jaw. And so they're trying to relieve it by not chewing on crunchy vegetables, but crunchy things. And yeah, it's pretty crazy. Now, what's your view? And I'm curious about this. You have a lot of people right now talking about this whole ancestral living thing, right? Don't, if it didn't exist a hundred years ago, don't put it in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really cute narrative. I think it's romantic. And I think it's really, it would be great. But even the food that we source ourselves, that we perceive to be healthy, we have no idea what it's being made with. I don't, if you get, unless you're the person who's slaughtering the cow yourself and you've raised it since it was a calf, how the fuck do you know? Unless you're the one yeah. who's pulling the beets out of the ground yourself and you know that soil has never been chemically processed. There's been no BPA or D, whatever it is, DHT put it like, we don't know. <laughs> And that's the th like when I start, you start going down this rabbit hole of like organic. And I do think there's merit to stuff like grass fed, grass finished, pasture raised, wild caught, just because if you are going to eat an abundance of protein, you might as well make sure that's the highest quality possible. Like dollars to donuts. If you're eating the 40% of your diet is protein, let's make it like at least good. But aside from that, is it possible to even try to do this like ancestral thing and like actually abide by it? And is there really any benefit to it? Yeah. It's one of those things where, like you said, I think it's a nice idea. Yeah, I do think looking at stuff from an ancestral health standpoint as a lens to view things is useful. But at the same point, then you have to look at what does the actual data say when we have data available? Because just because they did it a hundred years ago doesn't mean that we should do that now. We go back a couple hundred years, like penicillin didn't exist. Ooh, 
should I not use penicillin because we didn't have it a couple hundred years ago? It's like, no, you're stupid. Like penicillin, like it'll probably save your life if something really bad happens. But I do think that an ancestral living is a good lens to try to figure out, should I take the stairs or the escalator? They didn't have escalators a hundred years ago. Okay, stairs might be a little bit better, but I think you can think your way through that. And even like the fruit we have now was not like the fruit they had even 200 years ago. All that stuff has been crossbred and done all this stuff to produce more fruit and everything else. And again, that doesn't mean that it's automatically bad though, right? Because now people are like, oh, if it's been gen genetic engineered, then it's horrible. It's eh, maybe not. I don't know. But yeah, even with like beef, like you, like my bias, what I do is if I'm going out or I'm going to order something and it's a steak, okay, I'll order the steak. If it's a hamburger, I actually, I tend to pass because... I'm just a weirdo and I don't know how many animals went into that hamburger. So yeah. we're lucky, like in Minnesota, we usually get half a grass fed cow from farmers we know in Wisconsin nice. and we get to process it. And the reality is we can get it for almost the same price as what we were to buy conventional meat off the store. Wow. At least then I know all that hamburger came from one specific cow. So stuff like that I'll do, but again, you have to pick your battles. The other thing you can look up is the dirty dozen for foods that tend to have a lot more pesticides in them. If you can reduce those, you're probably going to be better. But then it's how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? If you have an organic farm next to a conventional farm, they don't put like walls up around it to prevent stuff from potentially crossing over some of the soils or transitional soils. How long do you have to have it to be considered organic? Some organic pesticides are probably not that good either. Do you want to go biodynamics? Now we got to get the beetles in to kill this thing, to kill that thing. And it's nice. And I think if more people went to more local permaculture type things, I think, yeah, I think everything would be better. This kind of mono agriculture thing is not super sustainable, but you have to deal with what you're living in now too. And again, pick your battles of what you think is going to be useful versus not useful, where you're going to spend your money, et cetera. I think yeah. it's unrealistic to assume that Betty is going to switch to all organic food and go to Whole Foods or wherever and get grass raised cow. And yeah, if you can get higher quality stuff, I think that's good. But you can't use that as a thing to be like, I can't get grass fed cows that I know their first name. So I'm just not eating protein. You got to <laughs> make a concession somewhere. <laughs> I don't need to be intimately involved with my meat that much. Like that, have you ever heard? Of, have you ever heard of like the Wagyu cows in Japan? Like when you, oh yeah, to, where they they give you like a pamphlet on the cow's life. Yeah, I would have such a problem with that. It's a killing. It's like killing a pet and then eating it. I don't want to know how well it was living prior to me murdering it and then eating it. Like I have zero problem with eating animals at all. But when you give me like a biography of this thing and tell me like all of its family members and like what its hobbies were and what it enjoyed doing on a daily basis and what its favorite song was. Now we have a problem. Yeah. My friends of ours, they have a small hobby farm. And so they have a kid when she was younger. They said, Hey, you know, you can name the cows. What do you want to name them? She's like, dinner and lunch. <laughs> That's a badass like kid. No of what was going to happen to the animals? <laughs> yeah. This isn't going to be, a, this is not a family pet. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to chat a little better for you. We still have a couple of minutes. I wanted to yeah. chat with you about, so just the conversation I was having with my ER doctor client this morning who had read a book and then it was basically like, if you eat less carbs, you start to become more fat adapted. Let's chat about this idea of burning fat that we're eating as dietary fat versus expelling fat, breaking it down from triglycerides into free fatty mm -hmm. acids, yeah. releasing it into the bloodstream and then using it as energy. These are distinctly different things. If there's a way, it's almost like I'm interviewing you for your own body. Yeah, whatever. But it's fun. I think this is all, and audiences will enjoy this. What is like the 30,000 foot view of how that would be explained to like my father who could barely speak English? So how I explain it to people is there's two things. So one, fat is a fuel that your body can use. Ideally, we want that to be as high as possible because it's one of the main fuel sources. It's also a super efficient fuel source. Like athletes could run multiple back-to-back -back marathons, even lean athletes, because they have such a enough body fat to do that. So fat is a very efficient form of energy, which is a good thing. But now, rabbit hole number one, you just said that, right? So if I'm a client 
and I'm considering keto, but I'm super athletic and I run a lot. I want to be on keto because of what you just said. Yeah. And my next question would be, do you want to win or do you want to finish? <laughs> <laughs> if you just want to compete, like I've worked with clients who wanted to do a marathon and did a keto. Like for some of them, it was actually easier. Great. That's good because you don't have to worry about fuel stations. You don't have to worry about all carbohydrates. I guarantee you're not going to win and you'll never win. But if you just want to finish, cool. Context, what do you want to do? And I think uh, that's such an important point because I think so many people are like, I did keto and I ran a marathon. It's okay, sure. Cool. And I ate like shit and walked a marathon. Yeah. Still, you, you and I both finished. Yeah. Yeah. And again, to context, I'm working with a guy who's working to be the first solo person to ever cross Antarctica unsupported. Jesus. Yeah. He's a super crazy guy. Super, super wonderful dude. And part of our discussion was I'm helping with his nutrition. So we're considering a high keto amount, maybe some carbohydrates, when we place them, what are the mechanics of like heating water to make even oatmeal, like all this stuff goes into it. But the reality is because he's carrying all of his own fuel with him, that is a much better fuel source for him because his goal is endurance for long periods of time and efficiency of moving food with him. But back to your question. <clears throat> Fat is a good source of fuel. The next question is, where does it come from? So it can come from food, but it literally gets broken down into the same components, free fatty acids, or it can come from wherever it's stored on your body, right? There's different locations of where fat is stored, but it's broken down and it still shows up again. So the question then is, what is actually present will determine what usually gets burned. So you're always using some amount of fat and then you've got so the analogy I use is like a bathtub. So imagine I've got water coming into the bathtub. I've got a certain level of water and then I've got a drain in the bathtub. So there's always water coming in and water going out, right? And that's going to keep a certain level in the bathtub. If I want that level to go down, so I want my body fat to go down, I can either put less water in and have the drain be the same, or I can make a bigger drain. So I want to burn more calories. If I could do that preferentially from fat, which is a whole different discussion. Ideally, yes, I would do that. Physiology doesn't work quite that way. But I still want a lot of energy going out through the bottom of the drain. I want to limit how much is coming in, right? So it is true that if you limit the amount of fat coming in via dietary sources, you will tend to use more of your own body fat. Now, the caveat is, that doesn't mean that's automatically going to make you leaner just because you cut down the amount of fat that you're eating. And that's where you get back to the calories and the total amounts and what other fuels are actually showing up and you're putting in at the same time. And that's where people get hung up, right? Because they're like, oh, I thought it was all just about like fat balance. And then you tell them that, yeah, you could potentially convert carbohydrates even into fat via a process called DNL, right? De novo lipogenesis in the liver. They're like, oh, shit. And then you tell them that like, that only happens at probably single digit percentage. And they're like, oh, nothing makes sense. I hate you. <laughs> and then I think with that, like when people start to, and I think it's always carbs that are this demonized yes. evil food. And it's also because I think people, well, A, by and large, people suck at tracking. Yep. That's a pretty, I think that's a relatively safe assumption to make. A lot of people are guesstimating when they track, which to me is like, Better than nothing, but not much sometimes. There's a cop stand on the, uh, imagine a police officer pulled you over and had no system of actually measuring your speed. It was like, I think you were going about 90. No. Here's your ticket. Yeah, no, it's not, no. <laughs> like they have a machine for that thing. Like you have a food scale. Now, granted, nutrition labels are what they're allowed to be like X percentage amount off. Yeah. Um, they're allowed to round up and down. And none of this is a, precise, is a precise science. Unless you're in a controlled no. city in a lab, like in a vacuum where they're like literally actually burning food to see how much, to see at what level it burns out. Like you have no fucking clue. You and your just, output side is almost impossible to measure. That's Forget about output. Like any yeah. of the, like these stupid <laughs> fucking things that are telling you like, you burned 3,800 calories today. It's like, okay, how? Explain to me, did my watch know that every single muscle fiber in my bicep was burning at the same time? Like they have no idea. Like steps, heart rate, sure. Great, yeah. like some level of accuracy. But like a food scale and a nutrition label and some acumen there actually is relatively accurate. It's not, but if you use it consistently, like you sitting in a restaurant and saying, I had about 17 tortilla chips and the salsa <laughs> and the cheese <laughs> made was maybe 25 grams. You don't know. No. 
And this is why, like, when people go out to eat, they're like, I think, I think I was pretty spot on when I logged my food out when I was out. I'm like, okay, cool. So do that five times a week and then tell me that you were accurate. And then we wonder why the scale isn't moving in the right direction for you, but you're still eating five meals uncontrolled out. Now, granted, you're making good choices, but you have no idea how much oil they use. You have no idea what they're cooking stuff in. You have no idea what the portion sizes are, even if you know how to eyeball them. You're not accounting for every single bite, lick, and taste. So you can't tell me that if you're, and if your body is naturally maintaining weight at 14 or 1500 calories, you have a pretty sensitive metabolism that if you go 10 or 20% over, that's a surplus. It's mm -hmm. not hard to run a surplus when you're, when your maintenance calories are 1500. Oh yeah. And if you've ever spent any time in kitchens, like I guarantee 99% of the chefs are not back. They're going a half tablespoon of oil on this. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> No, but like, this is why I think the case to be made for muscle mass is so important. Sure. If, you, if you want to buy yourself some caloric and metabolic flexibility, just spend a lifetime building it and keeping it. That's, you're never going to have a, a get out of jail free card when it comes to food ever, unless you want to be like one of these complete psychopaths who like brings their food scale to the restaurant and do all that shit. <laughs> but if you want to at least be able to mitigate damage and give yourself some flex, just strength train and build tissue as frequently and as much as possible. You'll never get too big. It's relative shit. I'm on fucking 180 milligrams of test a week and four, I use a growth a week and I can't grow and I'm eating 3,500 calories. So if I can't do it, I promise most normal people can't do it either. You're going to get, you're going to get some newbie gains, which is awesome. Congratulations. You're doing something I wish I could still do. But the idea that like when you're in most the overeating thing, I think is such a menacing thing is people, when they start tracking food, they're like, oh my God, I'm doing something so good that I've never done before. This is going to, this is going to impact me so positively almost immediately. No, like tracking food is not a automatic fat loss tool. It's an awareness yeah. tool. It's a GPS system for what's happening, but you have no every, so step out of that environment for five minutes. And now all that data is now gone and you have no idea how much you just ate. And if you were living on 14 or 15 or, and that's the thing is the other point of like maintenance calories, it's not a pinpoint number. No, no. Like it's not, if I'm at 1500, but I ate 1506, I'm just going to put on fat. Or if I ate 1497, I'm just going to start losing fat at this rapid rate. Like it's probably a two or 300 calorie range that you could live with it. Yeah. And you're dealing with a complex a dynamic system. And that's the hard part people forget is that. As you eat more and eat less, your metabolism and the amount of energy you spend just total, right? So total daily energy expenditure, shocker also changes, right? Cause like how many people have you added food to their macros and they start losing weight, right? And then their head spins around and they go, whoa, physics sucks. It doesn't work. And so, but some people, when you overfeed them a little bit more, like Levine's done this like cool study in Mayo, like one of my favorite studies ever done, eight week study. They said, okay, we're going to take these general population people. We're going to overfeed them a legit thousand calories per day. Wow. For I think it was eight weeks. And their estimation was they're going to gain about 15 pounds of fat. And they run the study. They did not change exercise. They said, just don't do anything different. Don't change your lifestyle. Eat these extra calories was monitored. Most of the people I think gained like eight pounds was the average. Some people only gain like two or three pounds and some people gain like 16 pounds. And they're like, what the hell? This makes no sense. And then they realized some people, when you overfeed them, they unconsciously move more. They start walking, they start twitching, they tap in their knee. They're doing all these things to try to burn off some of those excess calories. But it was an unconscious thing that they were doing. They didn't know per se they were doing it. And some other people were just like a sea slug on your couch. Like they didn't move anymore at all. But how do you so, measure that, right? Like how do you account for that need, that the increase so in that's, need? That's the tricky part, right? That was their theory. So some other studies have supported this. You can look up thrifty versus non-thrifty metabolism and it's debated. But I've seen this happen in practice, right? You've had the classic old school lean gainer, like the, the eel-shaped rake who can't gain any weight. And then you look at what they're actually eating and they're not even eating remotely enough calories. But there are some of those people where they eat more. It does take quite a while. I remember asking John Berardi this years ago. I said, yeah, I got this kid. He's at 3,000 calories and 
we just can't get him to gain weight. What do I do? He's keep having to eat more calories. He's like, we will not out eat his metabolism forever. He's like, oh yeah. Good point. That's, that's true. <laughs> Cause at some point it's going to change and going down is the same way, right? You've got some people who appear to rapidly adapt to a lower caloric level. And like one guy I worked with now, he lost 30 pounds. I didn't change his macros once. Now, granted, he was probably off on his estimates. He was exercising, but I'm primarily looking like you probably do the same thing at the output indicator and the input. So I look at more like the output. So in his case, his performance of the gym was going up. His cardiovascular performance was going up and his body weight, just by scale weight, get on the scale every day was slowly trending down over time. So each week I was like, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. We'll tweak your exercise a little bit. Yeah, keep doing what you're doing. He runs in a few issues. We work through them, some social stuff, some counting, nothing too major. But again, I'm looking at the outcome metric. Like his macros are probably all over the thing, but I'm not going to berate him and be like, hey, bro, you're losing like one to two pounds a week. Better tighten up those macros. It's like, yeah. no, like he's doing the thing he needs to. It was enough oversight for him to get the result. For other people, yeah, you have to tell them like, okay, we're going to do a video call and I'm going to actually watch you weigh your chicken breast because none of this shit's adding up. And I don't know what's going on and none of it makes any sense. <laughs> I've had that happen. It's a tough conversation to have because it's basically oh, saying, yeah. I don't trust you, which, but I say that's everybody. That's exactly why I want to see you. I want to see videos of you in the gym. Yes. Like I, I want to see what you perceive to be a hard set. Show me what <laughs> a hard set is. And when we start watching people's training, and I think this is why, not that I think that reverse dieting is a farce. It's that I think it needs to be applied to people who are actually fucking earning those calories. And I talked oh, to you sure. about this before. Like if you're walking into the gym and leaving 10 reps in every set in the tank, you have zero need for a surplus or even probably maintenance calories. You can do that on a deficit and be just fine. Yeah. You're not going to build any lean tissue. Probably you're probably just going to stay where you're at and you're just going to prevent any atrophy or any muscle loss, but you're not going to gain anything. But if you're truly walking in there and two out of three sets are being brought to failure, like, sure. Yeah. We have a case to be made that you probably need some more fuel. And then you start to become a little bit more energy balanced where the energy in matches the energy out. And that's a really nice place to be because then we can actually pivot in some directions that get really fun. But that can take people years to get to. Like, even me, like, I thought I was a calculator. I realized very recently I'm fucking not a calculator. <laughs> like, I'm not. I thought I was so efficient because of the years of data that I've collected and how much I've tracked and how diligent I was. But even now, I, I realize that, like, I can have days where I eat and I've, I have data for it. I track every single piece of food that goes. If I eat a bag of chips, it gets tracked. If I eat a Five Guys burger, it gets tracked. And there was times where on Fridays and Saturdays, sometimes on Sunday nights, I would be putting down 5,500, 6,000 calories of dog shit food, <laughs> just complete garbage food. No, no meaningful change in physique, a lot, a lot of digestive issues, a lot of sleep sure. problems, the quality of life generally just went down, but nothing changed. I didn't put on the way that I ate. If my clients ate the way that I ate there would be such massive fluctuations in scale weight that they would probably kill themselves. <laughs> but like for me, I, don't, I, I step on a scale once a week and the number rarely ever changes. Like I'm trending down like a quarter to a half a pound a week right now because I've really tightened things up and I'm actually like, I'm only eating one meal out a week and mm -hmm. that's relatively good. Like I had sushi one time, I had Mediterranean the other time. No desserts, nothing, like no overeating after dinner. But like most people don't live like that. No. And the question is, do you want to live like that? What is the cost? How uncomfortable do you want to be to get to your goal? Right. And that's something I figured out. Like I haven't tracked anything in probably three years. You have. But I know if somebody said, hey, you have a photo shoot in a year, I'm probably going to make some changes, right? It depends on what is the cost of also being leaner. Right. And right now it's like, probably like the highest I want to be in terms of body fat. So I'm going to slowly start going down, but I'm just monitoring my exercise, doing more walks. I'm down on South Padre. I'm going to kiteboard more, bump my protein up. I don't necessarily track those things, but I know historically, because I think once you've controlled your weight, you know, the set of actions to do to get it to go up, the set of actions to do to go down. And a lot of times those people are the ones that just don't care. I don't get for me myself. Like I don't get that worried about it because I know if somebody, if it became a high priority, 
I know what I need to do to get there. I just don't want to do it right now with everything else that's going on, to be honest. And before I was leaving, like I wanted to hit some strength goals that I had. And it was just easier to do it when you're eating more calories. That's just how thermodynamics works. And since all my lifts were going up, I'm just like, fuck it. I'll just see what ends up. And I got close to 239. I was like, oh, I didn't expect to go that high. But whatever, my, all my lifts were going in the right direction, so it's fine. I'll scale back down a little bit and don't worry about it. But it's the clients who have never either gone up or down that are really hard to work with because they get stuck in the mindset of the past of everything I've tried hasn't ever worked, which is why I'm working with you this time. And it's hard to get them to see the success. And sometimes in those clients, I paradoxically had them go up before they go down. I'm like, our goal is like the stuck car in Minnesota. If you put the car in the ditch, you don't just push hard on the car the whole time you have to rock the car back and forth. So like, I want to get momentum and variability into the system first, and then we'll worry about the direction. So when someone gets super stuck now and they don't change at all, I'll paradoxically go up and then they'll go back down again. So if you ever looked at people's like weight trends, just, just scale weight, what do you, you don't see a linear line that goes straight down? Never. It goes up, down, up, down. It, there's this variability in it. And part of that is going up before it goes down. I think that's just the system. But it's so hard with clients who don't understand that and have never experienced it. Because like you said, they get on the scale. They're like, oh my God, I went out last time two pounds up. Um, I screwed um, it down. <laughs> it's like, I, you probably didn't gain two pounds of fat overnight. I can almost guarantee you did it. Now, did your scale weight say two pounds? Yes, it does. And we have to have this conversation, but yeah, I get it. It's, it is hard because they don't have the control because they've never demonstrated to themselves that they could do it and be successful. I've had to explain to women, I think Eric Trexler was on Danny Matranga's podcast and he, and they, and they recited some research that he had done and it was like 9,700 or 9,200 calories to put on a kilogram of body fat. It could be. Like yeah. you'd have to, you'd have to be in that much of a surplus, which I mean, if you break that, what is it? 97, 9,200 divided by 2.2. So I guess that would be what about 4,000 something over yeah. 3,500 is usually over. Yes. Surplus. Chronic, chronically over your maintenance calories. Like, yes. I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones, there is no universe unless you're just, if you do what I do, sure. Maybe you'll get there. <laughs> but like, I mean, I, I have women who like, who tell me that they're overeating and like, I look at their food. Now, granted, again, this is always like, you have to take measuring with a grain of salt. Yeah. But like they're so worried about this concept of overeating. It's if you're chronically doing this every single night and you're upset with yourself, that's a psychological problem. That's not a physiological issue. Oh, hundred percent. But if you're, you'd have to do this egregiously for two, three weeks straight to notice a meaningful scale weight change that's actually accumulated body fat. And if you're in the presence of strength training with relative intensity, you may also finally be putting on some muscle mass too, which yeah. if you're putting on a quarter pound of muscle mass and a quarter pound of fat, we have no fucking way to measure that. Oh no. And like body circumference measurements, like even when I do them, I see variability and I'm pretty accurate. Yeah. Still the, where you hold the tape on your body, what state you're in, how much fluid you had the night, but like all of the, like, I'm actually having a zoom call with my clients at six o'clock tonight after this and the amount of like panic that I have to just like subdue <laughs> on a weekly basis. I'm like, guys, I wish it was linear. I wish it was perfect. I wish all of you were calculators and metabolic calculators. I wish all of your physiologists were as responsive as I had 16 beers and I put on 16 pounds. It doesn't work like that. No. And if it did, the human race would be wiped out. Oh, you, 100%. You would have been dead eons ago. Yeah. I tried to explain to clients as I, I should write this article. I've been meaning to do it for years. It's the title is, you're just not that fragile. Humans are like extremely robust. Like my, the words I've used is like, human physiology has every bad engineering word associated with it. It's anisotropic, it's nonlinear, it's chaotic, it has multiple redundant backup systems, which is good because it's all 100% survival based. Like your body is doing everything possible in order to survive. That is priority number one not adding more muscle. It's not body comp. It's not any nope. of those things. Nope. So if you want more of those things, like how do you teach your body to survive better? And the fact that you can do those, to, to me, it's like fascinating. If I put a sugar in the gas tank in my car, I'm probably not making it around the block. 
The fact that some clients can survive on seemingly 7-Eleven Slurpees with no ice for years on end, and they're still upright. Like they're not the epitome of health and body comp, but they're still walking around. They're not pushing up daisies. No. That's fascinating. Like how the hell does that, like just literally eat trash and you're still here. Oh, I, a, bu- a buddy of mine, blowing. a buddy of mine drinks three handles of vodka a week. Oof. Smokes two, two to three packs of cigarettes a week. Probably does two to three grams of cocaine a week. Yeah. Weighs about 340 pounds, and that's not muscle. Doesn't exercise, drives 90% of his life, sit, like it says, 90% of his life is seated and eats out two to three meals a day. Probably more mm-hmm. than that because he travels for work. The fact that he's still on both feet. Yeah. And is alive. Like it's astonishing. If he can handle that type of abuse to his system, like, you having a dinner out with your husband on a Saturday night is not the reason why you're, you're why you've put on 50 pounds in two no. years. Like it has got to be, it has to be perpetual neglect or just the lack of attention to detail or the lack of a framework. This is why I think it's like, there's no such thing as fat loss and there's no such thing as fat weight, lo- fast weight gain. And if it was that fucking rapid, the chemistry set is so off that we need to start doing some pretty deep that that's, and I get it. Like we have hormones and we have gut health issues that oh, when sure. you've done, when you've done everything right for six months and we still have no answers, maybe we start going down the doctor house route, but like nine out of 10 times, it's probably a compliance problem. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember talking about Ben, he was at a conference in the skies this is years ago when the Dutch test first came out. No. Like, hey, and what do you think of the Dutch test? Oh, what are you trying to do? He's like, hi, do you exercise? No. How many hours do you sleep? He's like, five. He's like, do you log any of your nutrition or what's your nutrition plan? Like, I don't really have one. He's like, you don't need a Dutch test. You just need <laughs> to hire a coach. Do some simple stuff. He's like, no, but I think the Dutch test will tell me everything I need to know. He's like, no, save like your $700 or whatever. Hire a coach. And eventually it left with them like the guys. Like, I think I'm still going to do a Dutch test. Uh, but again, it, it, propaganda, he probably read that it's broken somehow. This is yeah. going to give him the answer and give you answers, but it potentially can spin you off in the wrong direction too. And what are you, you going to do with How many data? people major in minors? Yeah. But like, like what, like people ask me about like body fat percentage. Who gives a fuck? Yeah. Like who gives a fuck? If you're 38 versus 28, does your life change at all? No, like, you don't know the difference. Maybe if you're a stage competitor and you want to see like striations in your glutes, yeah, sure, go get a DEXA scan. But if you're if you have like literally visible hanging fat in places that you can grab with both hands, you don't need a fucking body fat test. No, just start moving your body and eating food that's real in a decent quantity, and just lay off the shit that makes you feel like crap. That's it. Do that for the next ten years, you'll be okay. It doesn't yeah, have to be any more complicated than that. And you'd be amazed too. Like I, when I did labs at the University of Minnesota as part of my PhD, we did, one of the things I did was I, okay, can I take a week period of time and see how many different ways I can get my body fat tested? So I had skin calipers. I had dollar BIA machines, like the expensive ones with the pads and everything. I had a DEXA, I had underwater Wayne and I had bod pod. Jesus. And literally in body fat percentage numbers, I was either... I'm pretty leaner. Oh my God. I'm like catastrophically obese. Like it varied by up to 12 to 13 percent body Jesus. fat, not percent variability, percent in body, body fat. fat. Wow. And it was mind blowing. When we did body fat analysis, underwater wane and bod pods on hundreds, probably thousands of students by the time I left. And so you get bored doing it, right? Because I'm the one operating the machine. You know, like, so we play the game of let's guess everyone's body fat, right? When they come in, which you probably shouldn't do this, but we're <laughs> bored. We didn't tell anyone to publish it. And if the machines were accurate, it was crazy how far off we would be on some people. And I think wow. the machines were still calibrated because just the way people hold fat and that kind of stuff. And like, I've seen like some female competitors, like very lean abs, but a fair amount of fat in their lower body. So everybody holds it in different places. They can look very different and have literally the same body fat percentage also. Because there's this perception of, and yeah, at some point, yes, if you do get lean enough, yes, the numbers all merge together. But I think people would be shocked at what someone looks like and what their percentage really is. And it's 
not what they think. And the, and, the, the best it. one we had was a female competitor, mixed martial art competitor who competed at the UFC. She was five foot five. And if you saw her in street clothes, you'd be like, yeah, she works out, but not super, super big. But you would see her at a weigh-in and you're like, wow, she's pretty shredded. That has a lot of muscle. And so we played this game in the lab with the female competitors and she was totally fine with it. We're like, okay, guess how much do you think she weighs? Like all the females in class were like, 120, 110. She weighed 156. Oh my God. And if you saw her, you, there's no one in general population would have guessed that she weighed that much. But she had a lot of muscle mass. She was just bigger and had been training for most of her life. But again, most of the women would be like, oh my God, I could never weigh that weight. W would you want to look like her? Oh, yeah, of course. You realize she legit weighs 156 because that was her weight at an official weight and on TV, right? <laughs> Yeah. They're like, but well, I don't want to weigh that much. Oh my. <laughs> yeah. And that's, we could literally end it right there and just say psychology is the reason why we have problems. Like we don't have a body. We have an obesity issue because we have a mental health problem. If you right. haven't seen the movie, the whale, watch it. What is it? The whale. Okay. It's with Brendan Fraser. It got all, I got all sorts of hype because it's a movie. It was getting a lot of controversy because it was basically like they were calling it like fat shaming porn. Oh, okay. Basically, it's a, it's about a guy who's sedentary in his house. He's a professor, an online school professor, and he just he doesn't have his camera on because he's so morbidly obese. But it goes into the psychology of like why he got obese and how he punishes himself with food. But it's an amazing movie. But it wasn't by accident. Yeah. It's not because his hormones were broken. Or because he couldn't digest seed oil. It was because he just fucking overate, um, basically sometimes on purpose because it was a coping mechanism, which sure. is what most of us do. We're stressed out. We, some of us eat too much. Some of us eat too little. It's not like the, I've had to say this so many times and people still don't understand what thermodynamics is, but like the thermodynamics law is real. Yeah. Calories matter. Yes. Composition of calories also matters. Yes. Every, the problem is everything matters. And you sure. can't just, you can't just pick one thing out of a hat and say, this is the reason, or this is not the reason you just have to understand how to tie it all together. And luckily that's why we exist. And my last comment on that is that for quite a while, I had a years ago, I had a client who was not happy with their self-esteem, wanted to lose 30 pounds. Long story short, we did it. She got to her weight goal and she was still unhappy and that was like scary for me because I'm like, uh oh, I screwed up. I went along for the ride thinking that this was going to solve her issues and that she'd magically feel better once she hit her goal and she didn't. And then she was completely confused because she thought that was the thing and it wasn't. And so I'm like, you can't just hate yourself lean, right? Yeah. yeah. You might get there, but you're still not going to change psychologically wise either. So it's if you don't like yourself and you've got self-esteem, you've got some other issues going on, then yeah, you should see a psychologist. If you want to improve your body composition, do some performance, whatever it is, cool, hire a coach. But so often those get just completely put together and I understand why, but it's, yeah, it's a lot more psychology mindset than anything else by far. Yeah. The science is, that's why I love Stan Efforting and, and what he always says. Yeah. The science and the compliance is science. What is it? The compliance is the science. Yeah, exactly. And it's so well said. That's all it is. Like we don't need to, your average person doesn't need to know about nutrient partitioning and real timing and gluconeogenesis and GLUT4 receptors. They would be bored to tears. They have habit-based issues that need help. And that's thankfully we at least are trying to be on the forefront of that. Yeah. And I do think I, there is a time and a place to understand physiology as sure. a coach. Sure. But again, your job is just a glorified translator. I don't mean that in any disrespect at all. I couldn't agree you, with you more. You translate it into actions a client understands, right? Yep. So we could have a, probably a two day conversation about the deadlift and rate coding and muscle recruitment and optimal form and whatever, but your coach is not going to give you a lecture on fucking rate coding. They're going to be like, push your big toe on the ground. Okay. Stand up. <laughs> Do this, squeeze oranges in your armpits, whatever the cues are, they're going to give you probably one cue and then watch you do it again. And if that wasn't right, they might want to understand all that complex stuff, but the goal is to give you the next better action item. And the action item is a thing that's like super simple.
And that's what drives progress. But yeah. everybody gets so hung up on, oh, but I got to look smart. No, you just have to get your client the result. Like that, that's, that's like the goal. And the simpler you can do that with less words, even better. It's like that scene in, have you ever seen Forgetting Sarah Marshall? No, I haven't. There's a scene where Paul Rudd is playing a surf instructor and he's just fucking stoned all day long. And <laughs> Jason Siegel shows up and he wants to get a surfing lesson because he's all depressed because his girlfriend left him. And he just keeps flopping down onto the board and then Paul Rudd's like, pop up. He's like, no, you got to go faster than that. Pop. He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. <laughs> it's like, but he just gave up on him immediately because he's like, yeah, that, but that's what it is. Half the time, nutrition and fitness is just figuring it out. Like you have, it's trial and error. I don't give a shit how good of a coach you are and how many PhDs you have, how many certifications you've achieved, you're, te you're guessing checking on 95% of clients because there's not one person that I've ever worked with who was like immediately responsive to anything. Oh no, no. And then the way is, do you set up the experiment that they're doing so that if this is not correct, then you know what direction to go. Once I figured that out, then it was much better because I'm like, okay. I think you're going to go this direction with this program. I think based on what I know, I think this is going to work, but there's no way to know hundred percent. If that doesn't work, then I know we need to go more in this direction. As opposed to like, when you're new, you're just like, hey, hey, try all sorts of shit. Just you don't, the you cool can't box. take the feedback from one to get you closer to the next thing. And that's where experience, knowledge, all that stuff comes in. Yeah. Man, I, cool, man. That was fun. I appreciate it, man. That was awesome. I could yeah. talk about this shit all day long. It's I have this session coming up in 30 minutes where we're, the topic tonight is compliance as it relates to results. Mm, I like that. And the subset of that was psychology of eating. It's going to be, I usually, what I do is I usually do a write-up on Tuesdays, which is what, it's funny because you said start a newsletter. And I'm like, I've been yes, trying to do should. newsletters. But this is, I just send it to my group of clients and it's basically just, okay, this is the topic. This is what my views on it are. Some of it's anecdotes, some of it's science, because I don't want to like really bore people. And then they read it. And then on Thursday night on Zoom, we discuss it. And then they have like as much Q&A as they need. But it's always interesting to me how many people are struggling with results that don't show up to these things. No, I'm like, I'm like you, I have 72 clients. I'm averaging like nine to 10 people on these Zooms. And the 72, and the nine people that are showing up are the ones who are actually doing really well. Yeah, shock. And then the 68 people that aren't showing up are the ones who are bitching and moaning on a weekly basis that this isn't working. I'm like, okay, cool. So I guess you're involved in the process. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. That was the thing John Brady said to me years ago that was helpful is, okay, so I either gave you the exact right action items to do and you didn't do it. So now I don't know, or you did it with 90% compliance, even if it's not correct. Cool. I know then I gave you not the best information, so let's go over here. But if you don't do it at 90, 80, whatever your compliance cutoff is, you don't know the answer to either one. The only way to figure that out is to do it at a high enough rate where we can be sure that wasn't the thing so we can find the thing. Yeah. And I've lost track of how many clients sometimes I have to explain that to of like, they're like, oh, it doesn't automatically work, but usually gets them a little further down the path. <laughs> I can't wait till this episode comes out because I'm going to blast this. So many people need this information because it's so basic because I think people are just yeah. running, around, run, running around thinking it's got to be this insane key that unlocks the door. It's no, just keep doing the shit for the next 25, 30 years until it just becomes habit. If you really cared about your aesthetics, you would not have let them go 30 years ago. If it was that much yeah. of a priority, and that's a shitty thing to hear and say. Oh yeah, but but like, I'm, like I'm sorry. I started lifting weights at 15 because I was vain and insecure. I'm 39 and I'm still vain and insecure <laughs> and I'm still lifting weights, but I've never, but like, I've never, I'm, I didn't have to start as a 43 year old person who has never done it. Yeah. And I have to empathize with that. And I get it. Like, it's going to be, a, but understand where the fuck you're starting from. Like you're starting from scratch. If I walked into Goldman Sachs and asked for a job when I had a fucking culinary degree, they'd be like, absolutely not. That's so, <laughs> but that's okay. That's not a disordered way of thinking. Like you're just an right. idiot. But the fact that people are, have this misconception of I could start tomorrow and in 90 days, everything will change. No, mm, absolutely no. not. And multiply that by another nine, maybe. And if you just, what, why would we just take the timeline completely off the table? Who gives a shit about the timeline? You're going to, you're going to, you're here anyway. Time's passing. You could either feel like shit while it passes or you could feel great. And fat is a symptom of poor health. That's all it is. Just simplify it that way. Like you're not fat because 
you weren't, you didn't come out of the womb fat 90% of the time. It was acquired over time based on behavior. Yeah. It's like the old saying, the body you have is a body you earned or whatever direction you're going. And that's, and once people even realize that, but again, you're back to Psychology. accountability and all that kind of stuff. And no one wants to hear that in today's society. Nope. But that's kind of the beauty of like strength training and everything else. It's like, no matter where you started, like you, the joke I've often made is that why did Oprah Winfrey have such a hard time getting leaner? Visibly see she's a public figure, weight's gone up and down. She has enough money. She has a busy schedule. I get it, but she could hire someone to be her chef. She could hire someone to watch every single rep she's doing. But the reality is even in that best case scenario, she still has to do all the work. There's no way you're going to ever outsource all of the work. You, it's just not possible. And once you realize that, you realize I can do things to make it easier. I can do things to set up habits. I can do things to rearrange my life so that I'm getting closer. I still got to lift the weight. I still got to eat the food. I st There's no way that you're ever going to get around that. And the good part is that once you achieve it, no matter what scenario you were in, you, you still did the work, right? Yeah. And you can be proud that, okay, I did the work and I got to this point. So it's not good or bad. It's just how you look at it. It's a great point. Cool, man. We're going to be able to find out more about you. Uh, I have a newsletter uh, coming out of here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll start mass producing. <laughs> I do have an email list now. Though. Thank hey, you for that. there we go. That's awesome. I'm on four weeks to the beach, the number four, the number two weeks to the beach on Instagram. My website's not really much to look at other than just a landing page, but most of my idiosyncrasies are on Instagram. If you have questions, you can DM me. There's nothing that you would ever ask me that you can't ask Mike. So I don't. I think the only reason why you would ask me anything is, is just because Mike wasn't on his computer for five minutes because I'm on yeah, my phone all, all goddamn. Day. You'll probably get back to him infinitely faster than I. Can. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm the I, pe people are actually like the dot 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 is still present when I'm responding to people. That is true. I've emailed and texted you. I don't know how many times you got back to me right away, and I'm like, it freaks me out. I may not be the best coach <laughs> in the business, but I'm the most responsive. I will promise you that. Yeah. Hey, listen, it destroys relationships and it makes me a very relying on this thing. So Pros and if, cons. You, if anything you need, I will answer immediately. Awesome. And then seminars coming up for coaches and everything. Uh, yeah. So we're planning 2024 coaching summit, the real coaches summit. Now it's in the works, but uh, there is a mailing list you can get on. If what I'll do is I'll just either email you the, uh, the link to yeah, we'll put it below you. that way. At least the people want to get on that mailing list. The price is the price is going to be relatively inexpensive and the offering is going to be a little bit more robust this year than last year or next year than la this year, because we're going to be offering all meals included. Oh, damn. Yeah. So now it'll be dinner during the happy hours as well. And it's going to be the format will change from three speakers at a time to two speakers at a time with 60 minute time slots, just to keep nice, just to give people more content, more information, less decision fatigue, and a little bit less uh, logistical issues. So we've learned our lesson. We're going to try to do a little bit better this year. Yeah. And I can say I'm obviously biased because I was speaking there, but it was awesome. Like even everything from the food to the delivery, the times between the speakers, everybody who showed up, like all the attendees that was, yeah, it was really good, especially for the first year, which yeah, first year conferences. I don't honestly do a lot of them because they can go really well or when they go bad, they're such a disaster. And this one went really well and it was super fun and yeah i, I highly recommend it, people show up next year yeah i'm praying hopefully this year i don't lose forty thousand dollars doing it yeah <laughs> <laughs> whatever dude it's money we'll make it back i'm not worried about it that's only money you'll make more that's tell it. myself I was, that a lot I, lately. yeah and uh, <laughs> yeah they just raised my rent by 200 bucks oh yikes whatever california welcome to the state welcome to the beach Cool, man. Thank you so much for all your time. I highly encourage people to check out your Instagram there and all your information, and hopefully they'll see you at the conference next year. Thanks, Mike. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Thank you to Aram for all of the great information and chatting with him is always a good time. <clears throat> As of this recording, we will both also be at the International Society of Sports Nutrition. It'll be down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'll be giving a talk there on a primer on psychedelics, our psychedelic supplements next. That'll be June 15th through the 17th. We'll put a little link 
down there for that also. I hope to see you in the FlexDive certification and hope to potentially see you in person at the ISSN conference in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Thank you as always for listening to the podcast. We really appreciate it. If you could place a very short review here or whatever stars you feel are appropriate, that really helps us out in the algorithm to keep the show going and to get a wider audience. If you have someone who wants to listen to this, you think would enjoy it, please forward it to them or share it on social media and tag us so we can say thank you, appreciate it, and we will talk to you next week. That was wonderful. Bravo. I loved that. That was great. Well, it was pretty good. Well, it wasn't bad. Well, there were parts of it that weren't very good, It could have been a lot better. I didn't really like it. It was pretty terrible. It was bad. It was awful. I was terrible. Get him away. Hey, boo. Boo.